Honourable Members, I'm about to give the uh, call to the Honourable Ken Baston, uh, and it is the Honourable Member's uh, first speech, so the usual courtesies uh, could be extended. Uh, the Honourable Ken Baston. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate our newly elected President, the Honourable Nick Griffiths. I'm sure, Mr President, that your deliberations will be wise and fair and I wish you well in this important role of managing the business of our Council. May I also congratulate the Honourable George Cash for his re-election as Chairman of Committees. Congratulations to all my fellow parliamentarians who have recently been elected to this chamber. I look forward to working with, closely with you all over the next four years for the benefit of both my electorate and the state of Western Australia. I also commend the members and staff of the House for the valuable induction courses that new members attended. I certainly found them most beneficial and now feel better informed and more confident in carrying out my duties in this House. As is customary in an inaugural speech, I'll briefly give members a quick overview of my background. My parents lived on a northwest sheep station on the coast north of Carnarvon. Although this lifestyle was idyllic for a young child, it was an isolated region. My early schooling was done by correspondence. The mail service was once a fortnight, and telephone lines were simple earth returns, a copper wire propped up by sticks. Cyclone warnings were transmitted by telegram if the line was still in operation. Normally the cyclone came before the telegram. I went on to complete my education at boarding school in Perth, only making the journey home three times a year. For the past 30 years, I've operated a pastoral lease 90 kilometres south of Carnarvon, producing wool for meat for the and meat for the export market. There are only 538 pastoral leases in Western Australia. And although I've had, had to contend with drought, floods and cyclones, I feel privileged to have had the opportunity to operate a business in the rangelands. I have been actively involved in many issues that affect the Gascoigne region. In particular, I have gained valuable knowledge through my involvement in local government, various agricultural committees and the Gascoigne Recreational Fishing Advisory Group. In short, I have lived and worked for the greater part of my life in the electorate. This has armed me with invaluable insight into the economic and social needs of the region at large, and this, I trust, will guide me in my deliberations within this House. Mr President, I feel very honoured and privileged to be a member of this House and in particular to be representing the electors of the mining and pastoral region of Western Australia, a region that represents so much export wealth for our nation and the powerhouse of Western Australia. The mining and pastoral electorate has the capacity to drive the Western Australian's growth into the future. We must not forget that the mining and pastoral electorate represents 87% of Western Australia's land mass. The total value of the economy of the mining and pastoral region is some $27.5 billion. Approximately $23.4 billion of this is exports. This represents 21.5% of the national export income. I'm committed to the people of my electorate and will work to further promote investment and development in the region, enhancing opportunities for stable production, for stable population growth. I will focus on three strategies. Firstly, I will concentrate on creating incentives for business to operate and for people to live in the region. Secondly, I will look for ways to foster and enhance regional development. And thirdly, probably most importantly, 
I will seek cooperation between federal and state governments to achieve positive outcomes. Mr President, I would like to elaborate on each of the three key strategies that I have just outlined, as I see these as the necessary, necessary ingredients to drive future wealth creation and population growth for my electorate. The first key strategy is the creation of incentives for business to operate and for people to live in the regions. Provide the house with some context. If you draw a line from Sharks Bay across to Brisbane, the bit they were willing to give away in World War II, it contains approximately 6.5 per cent of Australia's population, but creates some 40 per cent of Australia's export income. It is understandable the feeling of neglect exists in rural communities. Those individuals that make up that 6.5 per cent that live in remote and regional Australia typify the iconic Australian character and they want a fair go. My interest in this issue became by way of an invite as a delegate to the Northern Australian Regional Forum in Catherine in Northern Territory in October 2000. This experience confirmed my view that the government investment, incentives and policies need to be directly targeted at promoting growth in regional economies. There is no doubt in my mind that the economic and population growth provides the key to long-term sustainability of regional Australia. Growth and economic development will contrib contribute to the overall health, cohesion and vitality of our regional communities. I see this as a key to turning around the difficulties faced by all people living in my electorate. Certainly one issue that the regional summit firmed up in my mind is the key to, those, to these incentives is not handouts. People should be rewarded for their personal endeavours and investment they place in the regions through progressive mechanisms such as tax incentives. Given incentives and encouragement, investment will occur. occur. You only need to look at the blue gum, olive, wine and film industries as proof of this. As you will come to learn, I am a great believer in the potential for tax incentives to drive investment in regional areas. Although this is predominantly a federal issue, I see a role for state politicians to work cooperatively with federal government of the day. I will discuss this issue in detail later. Another example of a progressive regime was the removal of the fringe benefits tax on the company supplied housing. While this represented a way forward, we need to continue in this vein to create further incentives. Furthermore, the entire concept of state air travel needs a review. It now takes twice as long to fly to Carnarvon from Perth as it did ten years ago. Other towns have lost their major air services altogether. This is not to mention the breakdown in regional airline linkages. If the city bus and train services need financial assistance, airlines throughout the state likewise are our bus and train service and therefore equally deserving of government support. It is my dream to see people grow up, work, raise a family, educate their children, retire and become grandparents within the electorate. Mr President, if I now turn to the second key strategy that I highlighted earlier, and that is the strategy of enhancing and fostering regional development to create wealth and population growth within their mining and pastoral electorate. As members should be aware, the industries within this region are many and varied. Agriculture, mining, oil, gas, tourism and fisheries, to mention but a few. I would like to make specific comments on each of these. Agriculture in all its forms plays a major part in the region. The Department of Agriculture needs to play a greater supportive role in encouraging improved production over the region rather than, that, than what at present appears to be its ever increasing role in compliance rather than in advisory capabilities. Over the last four years, thanks to the Honourable Kim Chance, I've had the pleasure of being a chairman of the Carnarvon Artesian Basin Advisory Group, which successfully undertook to rehabilitate the Artesian Basin, stretching from south of Exmouth to, uh, down to uh, Denham in the south. 
which, completed, which when completed will save some 90 gigalitres of water. This 7.5 million Commonwealth State project encourages the closing of old bores and refurbishing in a new state-of-the-art particular system. This huge resource and other potential water resources throughout the rangelands presents the electorate with a massive opportunities to contribute to regional wealth creation and population growth. Another critical issue is the capacity of the rangelands to diversify into the range of other land uses. Our current tenure system was put in place over 100 years ago and now does not reflect the current needs and future use requirements. Our current land tenure regime also does not encourage the investment which is cr critical for future growth. As opposition spokesperson for lands, I can assure the House I will take a keen interest in this matter. Tourism. There is no doubt that the outback towns can play a far greater role in local tourism than they do at present. Their full potential has nowhere near been achieved. The recently launched 3,000 kilometre Outback Pathways project, initiated by the Gascoigne Murchison Strategy, which I was a formerly a board member, is an example of how outback tourism can be promoted. For our tourism industry to, go, to grow, I believe we need to make sure that there are quality air services to all destinations of our state, not just a few major centres. These services need to provide a good base for packaged, realistically priced airfares, which are now expected by international and local tourists alike. I wish to put on record that I'll be working hard to achieve a review of the current policy and to commit to providing sensible alternatives, options and solutions. The fishing industry. A sustainable fishing industry of utmost importance to the coastal towns, both for the direct income generated by the commercial sector of the industry and indirectly to the tourism sector. However, fishing laws and regulation need to be simple and policeable. It is pointless to have a sanctuary zone introduced by one government department if they cannot be managed by another. For example, sanctuary zones that are introduced by CALM and then handed over to, over to fisheries to be managed. Mining. There is a much optimism for the future of Western Australian resource sector. However, mining has too has significant land tenure issues with the mining and pastoral electorate and is more generally a significant issue for our state. Planning delays and expenses caused by excessive and often unnecessary bureaucracy are a major hindrance to the development in the region. This is further emphasised by the confrontational nature of the legal process in many of the land title issues rather than localised conciliatory negotiations. This in particular applies to the mining industry. We must find a way forward to resolve this and I'm particularly keen to work with my state colleagues, our federal counterparts and the industry to do so. Mr President, I would also like to make some general comments about fostering regional development. Having some five years experience on the Gascoigne Murchison Strategy, a Commonwealth State Regional Development Program, I'm very, very quickly learnt that the key to making development projects happen is the capacity of institutional structures to make it happen. Members be assured that I will be vigilant and proactive in being an advocate of the one-stop shop approach to government services delivery and I'll be working with those precious few government development agencies to undertake an integrated approach to projected delivery. The other general comment I'd like to make is regarding the role of local governments in regional development. It appears to be a pattern developing within state governments throughout Australia to establish planning committees to override local government roles and functions. This is very centralistic and often can install unwanted, to develop, unwanted development in regional areas or inappropriate facilities. My experience with local government gives me the view that this trend is eroding the democratic rights of local councils. This means that developers of large projects will be able to bypass local councils and submit their plans directly to state government for swifter approval. This can arouse accusations of bias or political interference 
because the decision has gone outside a normal accepted democratic process. However, I do recognise the Minister as the final approval. Conse consequently, funding for local government infrastructure projects to support the massive revenue sources for the government needs to be more in tune with regional requirements. Mr President, I now turn to the final and probably the most important of the key strategies I alluded to earlier. That is to work cooperatively between the federal and state governments to create the much needed growth and population for my electorate. I've seen firsthand the benefits the region can achieve if all levels of government work cooperative together. In the past, I've seen major electoral benefits vanish for the sake of trivial party politics. I can assure the members that it is my vain hope that I can remain above the day-to-day -day cut and thrust of politics and resist the temptation to score cheap political points so that we can work together to capture the full benefits of my electorate. The relationship built up over many years with Commonwealth politicians and senior government officials is an asset I wish to translate into real action for the people of the mining and pastoral region. It's probably stating the obvious, but I believe it's worth restating. The Commonwealth have an extraordinary array of options to fund regional opportunities. If I can be influential in returning our fair share to Western Australia, and particularly to the mining and pastoral region, I'll take the cause to whoever and, whoever and wherever is necessary. In closing, Mr President, I would like to sum up by reiterating and putting on the record that while I'm in this House, I will commit myself to encouraging growth, wealth and population for within my electorate. Before returning to my seat, I would like to thank those who have helped me be here today. While there are too many to name, I, I apologise now to though I, those I miss. I would specifically like to thank my wife Robin, my sons Derek, Richie and Thomas for their support, encouragement and also their patience. I would also like to thank the members of the Liberal Party for pre-selecting me, a party that I've been a member of for some 20 years and very proud of. The individuals that encouraged me to participate in particular, Peter Broad, Gordon Thompson, Terry Carl, David Stedman, Ross Atkins, and the former MLA for the old seat of Ningaloo, Rod Sweetman, and my dear friend, the Senator Alan Eccleston, and also one other very close friend and a bush confidant, Peter Robson, who has been holding the fort together while I've been away. It would be remiss of me if I didn't recognise the members of this House for being so attentive and courteous during my first utterances in this House, and I trust you'll retain this some same civility and decorum the next time I rise to speak. <laughs> Finally, Mr President, I'd like to thank those who are the real reason why I'm here the electors of mining and pastoral region, the real people to whom I commit myself to work for with for the next four years. Thank you.